Well, last Sunday we began a, a three-part series uh, dealing with the subject of, of church unity. People getting along with each other in the church. There have been um, some, some, some people with questions about these things, concerns about these things from other, other, other church situations and such, and, and it just seemed like this was a good time to just tackle the subject. And um, so, so we're, we're calling the series 10 Ways to Ruin Your Own Church. 10 Ways to Destroy the Unity of Your Own Fellowship. And these are, these are simply the, the most common problem areas. When churches have problems, when you hear, hear about people not getting along somewhere, usually it's one of these 10 things. And, and the Bible speaks so clearly about each one of these Areas. It's not like it's not like problems in churches are just. I think I said last week it's not like a natural disaster that just happens just randomly. But it's people. It's people within those churches are messing up. They're 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 choosing a path of sin rather than what the Word of God describes. So last week we uh, of, of my list of ten we only got through two. Uh, but they were, they were two big, big areas. The first is the area of our interpersonal relationships. Uh, churches have problems when people do not reconcile their interpersonal conflicts. Uh, we will have conflicts, right? We, we're going we're gonna to sin against each other. We're going to have misunderstandings. We're going to have uh, hurts and offenses. And, and, and the Bible is clear. We can't just ignore these things. We have to deal with them rightly. And, and the Bible gives lots of instructions about how to do that. And sometimes we need to confront things head on and, 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 and ask and repent and ask for forgiveness and, and to give genuine forgiveness that these relationships might be healed and restored. Uh, so that was one area, the interpersonal side. The other, second thing we talked about last week uh, is the mishandling of criticism of church leaders. Uh, church leaders also mess up. And, and there's, there are right ways to deal with those failings. And, and so we talked about you know, that the Bible says that, that there's, there's really two sides to hold on to when you think of church leaders. One is we're supposed to appreciate them. We're supposed to esteem them highly in love, it says. But then the other side is, is, is we need to hold them accountable. It's not like they get a free pass and they can do anything, but they need to be held accountable as well for, for their sins and failings. And that needs to be handled in a righteous way or your church will have problems. Uh, so I don't say this very often, but if you were not here last week, it would be really helpful uh, for you to look up the recordings of, of the messages. They're all posted on our, our website eventually and hear what was said last week because there's a lot of important introductory things that we went over. Um, so we covered two issues last week. This week we pick up the pace and we'll cover four uh, issues that affect the unity of church bodies. And I know I said last week these were like the two most important ones, but I got finished this week and I feel like, well, these four are just as important as those two. It's like this, as you think of each one of these are big things. These are needs. These are problems that are extremely practical. Um, and so, may, you know, one, one of the things I said last week is, is we're just we're seeking to eliminate ways that the devil can get an advantage in our life, in our fellowship, and, and to be forewarned that we might be forearmed against his uh, tactics. So, so if we covered two things last week, then number three on the list is, is this, making too much of minor differences. The problem of making too much out of minor differences differences. I mean, when church relationships break down, it is usually not over some massive theological issue. It's not, well, I can't worship with these guys anymore because, because they're all denying the deity of Christ now. I mean, that, that, that never happens. Uh, in, instead, usually it's little stuff. It's little stuff. It's little differences that get blown up into some big thing. And, and so, you, so you hear about this big problem later from the outside and you say, what? That whole big kerfuffle was over that? Over that? It's so small. It's so petty. You destroyed your relationships over that thing. 
See, Christians in a healthy church will differ on a whole lot of minor doctrinal questions, uh, lots of lifestyle practice issues. You decide to do it this way, I decide to do it that way. Christians differ over how they observe the Sabbath and other holidays. Christians differ about how they dress or, or their haircuts. Christians differ over, over homeschooling and birth control and immunizations and alcohol and entertainment choices and uh, politics and, and, and doctrinal stuff, eschatology and spiritual gifts and baptism and so on. Actually, I'd say that if a church does not have a lot of differences in those areas, it's probably not very healthy. You'll probably, if, if everybody thinks exactly the same about everything, that looks a lot more like a cult than a church. You know, it probably just means everybody just kind of copying off each other or just copying what the pastor thinks on everything rather than seeking the Lord for themselves. Getting in the Word for themselves. Thinking it through, like, like it says in Romans, being fully convinced in their own mind of what they believe. I know we all have our, our, our precious convictions about this thing or that thing. You say, I, I'm sure this is the way I'm supposed to do it. And it's, it's really hard when you're really convinced on something to think that, that, there's, that there could be these godly Christians out here who think something different in that area. But it's true. And, and, and the fact is, we won't agree with ourselves in 10 years or 20 years. Because our own convictions are changing. Over time, they really are. There's going to be some things you're going to become more conservative on over time. Other things you're going to become more permissive on. Other things you're going to completely change your whole opinion on. And it's just because you're exposed to more truth. You're exposed to certain experiences and different people and they influence you. You see it more clearly. And over time, we, we shift. So we will have lots of minor differences guaranteed. The challenge then to our unity is, is not allowing those things, those smaller differences, to disrupt our love and our fellowship. Uh, to give grace to each other to be different. Be different in stuff. It's okay. Um, the Apostle Paul deals with this whole thing so, so thoroughly, you know, in, in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 14 and 15. If you'd like to open your Bible there, I, I mean, I could read the whole giant section, but I'll just pick out a, a paragraph that summarizes things. So Romans 14, we'll pick it up at verse 15, the church there in Rome that Paul is writing to, this was a church of a very different bunch of people. Rome was a, a cosmopolitan city. This church had, 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 had all different kinds of folks from all different places. Definitely Jews and Gentiles are there. And they had different views on lots of topics. And so Paul is dealing with them here. And he does not tell them, he does not tell them, hey, you guys differ on this thing and that thing. You need to split up. You need to have all little separate churches. Instead, he says, no, you, you, you stay together and you get along with each other. And he, and he writes all these, all these verses just, just going over very clearly how to do that. How to get along with people in your church that differ from you. So Romans 14, verse 15, it says, If because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Food, you know, what you could eat and not eat, what was clean or unclean and stuff, that was one of their hot topics. And he says, if you're hurting your brother over that, and that's not love, you're not walking in love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Think of it. This brother has been saved by the blood of Jesus. Am I going to destroy? Am I going to hurt his soul over something as small as, as my diet? Verse 16, therefore do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. Your convictions seem so good to you, but if they're handled wrongly, they'll become something evil. For the kingdom of God, this is the key verse, I think, in the whole chapter. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not what you do on these, on these small things 
It's not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those are the big things. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy... These are the big, big aspects of the kingdom. Keep the big stuff big. Keep the little stuff little. Keep that perspective. Goes on, verse 18, For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. What a good verse that is, right? We can choose to pursue in our relationships with each other the things that are going to result in peace and building up, helping each other get stronger, do better. We can choose what stuff to talk about, what stuff to uh, deal with. Verse 20, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. I mean, churches do this. They, they tear down the whole thing over some stupid issue. Come on, people. That's how you feel about it. You're tearing down the work of God for the sake of food? All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. And now he brings in the idea of the conscience. That something can be objectively okay, but yet if it defiles your conscience to do it, then you shouldn't do it. You need to follow your own conscience. And our consciences are in different places on different issues. I mean, there's different movies maybe we can watch and have a clear conscience or not. That varies. Is it good? It is good, verse 21, not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles. So you see, this goes beyond merely tolerating this other guy in my church. It goes beyond just tolerating and this differing brother, but it says, I'm willing to give up my rights for you. I'm willing to give up my liberties for you. I feel liberty in this area. I can do this. But I'm afraid it's going to hurt you somehow. It's going to hurt our church somehow. It's going to hurt our relationship. And that's not worth it. I'll give up that thing if I need to. If that's what it takes to have peace, if that's what it takes to love you, then I'm willing to do that. It's choosing love over self again and again. Now, it's okay to talk about, uh, talk about our differences. It's not like we need to be afraid of that. I mean, that's, you know, that's a way that iron sharpens iron, right? And it, it's a way we sharpen our own thinking. It's a way that we understand the Bible better. It's a way that, that maybe your mind can be changed in a, in a good direction. Um, it's okay to talk about it, to educate your conscience maybe. That stuff is good, but it's not okay. To talk about things in a harsh, angry spirit, of course, we know that. It's not okay to, uh, to, you know, to beat down the other guy. There should be a spirit of acceptance toward the one that differs. Maybe, maybe there'd be, maybe there'd be you know, somebody in our church that's different than everybody else in our church in some area. We've got to be careful with them so they don't feel like it's, you know, they're persecuted, ostracized in some way. Not judging, not despising. And there's just a huge danger of pride here. It's pride of rightness, you could call it. You know, we want to be right about everything. And it's right to want to be right. We think we are. We think we are right about everything. And think, well, you know, I'm right in all my doctrinal stuff. I'm right in how all of our church practices. I'm right in all my personal decisions and my lifestyle things. I just figure I'm right about it all and so then everybody else is wrong. But I hope we realize deep down we're not right about it all. I mean, we want to be. We want to be following the Bible as well as we can, but I hope we realize there's a whole bunch of things we're surely not right about. We're going we're gonna to get to heaven someday and we're going to think, how dumb was I? I can't believe I believe that. All those years. No. There's, there's lots of blind spots in our thinking. And just, oh, there's a need for humility that way. So rather than boasting in my rightness, I'm better off boasting in the grace of God that covers all my shortcomings, all the stuff I get wrong. God's grace is bigger than that. We sang about it today. The ocean of grace extended to us. We better, we're better off boasting in that grace. We're better off boasting in Christ 
Christ who was perfect, who did get it right, Christ who was perfectly balanced in everything, when we tend to you know, be too much one way or the other. And hopefully, as we, as we experience this grace we receive from God, hopefully we can extend that same grace to each other in the areas where we differ, in the areas where my brother or my sister might be wrong about something, to extend grace to them. So, so that's number three on the list then. Making too much of minor issues. Number four uh, is displaying an independent spirit. Displaying an independent spirit. I wish I had a better term for that, but this is what I've heard pastors call it for years. So I'll, I'll just stick with that. The independent spirit. Now, as Americans, we, we like the rugged individualist. You know, we, we like the guy that stands on his own and does his own thing and, and is, is independent of what everybody else thinks. The guy that can drift here and there and, and just, just whatever he feels like at the moment. That recipe works really well in Western movies. I like some of those movies. But that recipe does not work at all well in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's a bunch of real Christians, precious Christians, some some of whom we've had experience with here at at different times, who who see themselves as essentially independent from their church. And let me describe the kind of folks I mean. You know, they they think of of church not as a, a people that they belong to, but rather it's more of an activity that they choose to do at different times whenever it's convenient for them when it suits their agenda. They'll do this activity. Um, so they'll, you know, they'll show up for meetings when they feel like it, uh, or not show up, whatever. Uh, you won't know where they're at. Uh, they're just not there. It's nice when they're there, but you can't really count on them. They usually don't ask for counsel on things. Because they've got it all figured out. They don't need your opinion, your help on any stuff. Um, they often put the priority on their personal devotional life. They'll tell you all about these, you know, it's me and Jesus and their, and their times with the Lord, and that's good. But they don't see the value of the corporate worship and prayer and so on. If they do some kind of ministry, if they have their ministry, then their ministry is their priority. Over, over all the church stuff, over the ministries of the church. You know, that's their thing. If they have good family relationships, then their priority will be on their family. Their, their natural, you know, when, when, there's a, when you have to choose between the natural family and the church family, it's the natural family wins out every single time. That's, that's the characteristic of, that you often see with these people. They don't feel much, much loyalty to these particular folks in their church, so when they, when they decide there's a better deal out here, there's something out here that will make them more happy or be better for their ministry or something, they're on to the next thing. You know, and goodbye to you guys, I'm on to this. So you get the picture. This, it's an independent mentality that just affects lots of stuff in, in church life. Um, now I'm, I'm, I'm talking like, about it like it's bad, but why is it really wrong? Why is it wrong to be that? I mean, this, this works for John Wayne and Clint Eastwood, right? Be this way. Why is this wrong in the church? Well, it's it's because the Bible clearly describes the church functioning in a very different way. The Bible describes the church as members that are dependent upon each other. Everybody needs each other. You're not independent. You are in this thing and you need everybody there. And they need you in return. And I, it's, it's so clear there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you might turn there just a few pages to the right in your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, this, this, this wonderful analogy of the church as parts of a body. So 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. And, and basically, this whole paragraph is Paul sort of making the same point about dependence and just kind of hitting it from all different angles. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 12, 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. So all the different kinds of people, they're all equally part of this body. 
If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? And so, so he's saying, look, we need that diversity among the members. That's essential for health. But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as He desired. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. Verse 21, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. See, that's what the independent spirit is doing. It's saying, I don't need you. Are you? Are you? Are you? Are you over there? I don't need you guys. I'm fine on my own. No, the Bible says we need each other. You say, well, I need those important people, and I need the pastor and the deacons and the, you know, the evangelist. I, I need them, but I, no, all these, these other people, I don't really need them. They're not that important. Oh no, it says. On the contrary, verse 22, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. Our unseemly members come to have more abundant seemliness, uh, whereas our seemly members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked. I mean, the point is, everybody's important. Even the people you think less of, they are necessary. You need them. The body needs them. Verse 25, that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. What a challenging thought that is. Everybody having the same care for each other. It's not just, well, I, it's me and my five favorites. But it's all of us with the same care for everyone in the body. And then verse 26 sort of sums up the idea. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you're Christ's body and individually members of it. So many members, different, different gifts, different strengths. God has put them all together. Every part is important. Every part is dependent on every other part. Right? And if you subtract someone, there's going to be a hole. There's going to be a hole. There's going to be deficiency. You're going to feel it. In order for the body to be healthy, the parts need to be there and they need to be functioning in harmony with each other. Paul, Paul liked this body analogy for the church. He, he mentions it again in Ephesians. He mentions it over in Romans. And, and in those passages, I think in both of them, he uses this phrase. He says, we are members of one another. <laughs> members of one another. It's a sense we belong to each other. It's, like, it's almost like you have a claim on these other people that you're in church with. We are members of you and me. Interdependence. One person cannot suffer without everybody suffering. See, there's no room for lone rangers in this picture if we're just parts of one body that God has put together. Now, now all this truth I just talked about, this is plain as day to me standing here. Maybe it's not plain as day to some of you. I'll tell you what, it was not plain to me at all uh, years ago. I can remember, um, say, in my, in my 20s, a dear pastor there in St. Louis, he hammered on this point and I never got it. Maybe he hammered on it because I was there and I had a knucklehead attitude. Um, but he, he would say, this individualistic spirit, this is Western culture, this is not the Bible, this is not the church. The Bible's emphasis is on the group, not the individual. And we need to think differently in these things. And I would hear that and I'd say, oh, come on. You know, what's wrong with individualism, independence? I know what's best for me. I mean, what are you, a communist or something? You know, man. But over time, I think the Lord helped me to see these things. And now, now it's just so clear how much, how desperately we need everybody in the body. And how glorious God has set this up so none of us can be proud. And, and all of us have to give all the glory to the Lord. And, and so what we'll discover is there's, there's very dear Christians that don't get this. And um, that maybe just take a long time to understand the church the way the Bible describes it. Our culture 
evangelical culture does a very poor job communicating these truths, and, and so people have maybe not grown up with it, not seen it very well. And so they, they'll try our patience, but we need to be patient and love them and seek to preserve the unity of the body in the process. So that's the thought of, of the, the independent spirit and how that's a threat to our unity. Well, then the last two things I want to cover today are both talking problems. Sins of the tongue that can destroy church unity. You know those verses there in James that talk about, that talk about our talk uh, being really dangerous. You know, it says the tongue is a small part of the body, but it's like a little flame that can create a giant forest fire. Right? That's the analogy of Scripture, and that is so true. I had a brother just a few weeks ago telling me about some recent big problems in his church, and he said, he said gossip, criticism, and slander, that was the real problem in what went on. That, that was not the initial problem. The initial problem was something else. But that initial problem could have all been worked out if people would have just bridled their tongues and were careful what they were saying to each other. Um, over time. And instead, you know, a relatively small problem turns into a giant problem that affects the whole church. So we're going to talk today about gossip and slander. These often get lumped together, um, but really they're two different problems. So I'll, I'll treat them as two different things here. So number five in our list, receiving and repeating gossip. Receiving and repeating gossip. We all know that gossip is some kind of bad talk, but it's sometimes hard to pin down what it is. What exactly is, is gossip? Um, um, this this fellow here, Matthew Mitchell, is a pastor that actually wrote a book on, on gossip that I, I thought was excellent in terms of real practical things. And I, I brought it along. If somebody would like to borrow it, you sure can. Uh, I just read that a few years ago. His definition of gossip is, is bearing bad news behind someone's back with a bad heart. So those three elements, it's bad news. You know, it's not gossip, you're just talking about how great somebody is. Usually that's okay. Usually that's not going to cause too many problems. But it's bad news about someone. You're talking about it behind their back. So they don't know what you're saying. They're not in the picture. You're just talking about them to somebody else. And you're doing it with a bad heart. Your motives are bad in it. You're not, you're not doing it uh, out of love. You're not really trying to help the person. You're not part of the solution to some problem here where you're trying to work out something to benefit, but, but instead you're getting a perverse pleasure out of just hashing over somebody else's problem with your friend. We're not truly grieved about the bad news when we're gossiping. In fact, we enjoy it. I mean, it's a perverse, ugly thing, isn't it? To be enjoying somebody else's misery. I mean, the the term is juicy gossip, right? And and the Bible actually uses similar imagery to that, doesn't it? Let's turn to the Proverbs. Proverbs 26 would be one chapter that talks about... I'll just mention a couple verses there. Proverbs 26 and verse 22... The words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels and they go down into the innermost parts of the body. So it says hearing gossip, these, these things that are whispered, he says they're like, they're like eating candy. They go down to the innermost parts. It's, it's the idea, it's once, you, once you hear it, you're not going to forget it. it these things stick uh, in your memory for a long time. And it can really do great harm. If you've got all these people in the background passing along this kind of bad news with bad motives, it's devastating. I, I've mentioned D.E. Host before. He was uh, the guy that took over for Hudson Taylor uh, in running the China Inland Mission. He, he served there managing all these missionaries in China for, for a, a very long time. Uh, basically his whole life. And he said this toward the end of his ministry. He says, looking back over these 50 years, I really think if I were asked to mention one thing which has done more harm and occasioned more sorrow and division in God's work than anything else, I should say it was tail-bearing. Which is an old-timey word for gossip. 
He said, I mean, what a thing. I mean, I mean, they're in China. I mean, they had all kinds of opposition from the outside, all kinds of persecution, all kinds of you know, horrible tragedies happening. And he says, really, our biggest problem here was I couldn't keep the missionaries from gossiping about each other. Amazing. Sad, isn't it? It's quite a warning. So say there's a family in your church that's having some kind of, of a problem that, that is, is embarrassing for them. Maybe their marriage is in trouble. Maybe uh, there's, there's some disaster going on with their kid. Maybe, uh, maybe they've, they've had a failure in their job or their school or something. And uh, I mean, maybe there's addiction in the picture that they're dealing with. Maybe there's mental illness they're dealing with. I don't know. Um, and, and they just like to keep that quiet for a little while while they can work on that problem in peace. But if they get the feeling that everybody else in the church kind of knows about this and this information has all been passed around by people that were supposed to keep it quiet, and everybody's talking about them, that is just devastating. That is so hard. You know, they're dealing with the original problem, and then there's the sense these people in my church aren't really on my side. They don't love me. They're just, they're just, they just kind of enjoy my problems here. I mean, that's what the devil's whispering in their ears. And people that feel that way, they leave the church and they leave angry. They've been gossiped about like that. It's sin to tell gossip. It's also a sin to listen to gossip from somebody else. Uh, sometimes you need to stop somebody in a conversation and say, hey, sister, are you sure we should be talking about this? No. And if you do hear something you probably shouldn't have heard, you know, after the fact, you think, ooh, I bet those people don't want that out in the wild. The thing you do is tell not another human being about it. There's a, a verse right here on the same page about this very thing. Proverbs 26, verse 20. It says, For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisperer, contention quiets down. So you got this, you got this contention brewing here. You got this fire burning. And if you take away the wood from that fire, it dies down. He says in the same way, if you quit talking about something, if the whisperers quit spreading it around, then there's a chance for the whole problem to just die down on its own. The problem to go away. Now, now I was just talking about in the church, you know, it's like a body and everybody's dependent on each other and everybody's caring for each other and we all suffer together and so on. So within the body, there is a need to know what's going on in each other's lives. There is some need to communicate about people and our stuff. But we need to do with real caution. If you're, if you're in the spot where you're talking about bad news about somebody and that somebody is not there, there needs to be alarm bells going off in your head. And you're saying, well, I'm on dangerous ground here. And you need to be asking questions, you know, what is my real motive in mentioning this? Does this, does this other person, do they really need to know about this? Sometimes the other person, has, there, there's a legitimate need why it does need to be shared. But ask that question. Ask, would I want other people to talk about me in the same way if it was all reversed? You know, ask, if, if that absent person could hear the conversation, would they feel like they were being loved? Would they feel like they are being gossiped about? We've got one thing we've got to watch that, that I, know, I know are abused sometimes in church circles is things are couched in the, in the language of prayer needs. Oh, we need to pray for somebody. They are going through X, Y, Z, you know. And, and, and it's sometimes that is confidential stuff that's not meant to be public. And we need to keep that stuff confidential. I haven't seen a lot of problem among us this way, but, but it's just it's something where, where really there's not, there's not really a motive to pray. Nobody's going to really pray about that very much, but they just want to talk about the news. You know, it's, it's juicy morsels that way. Anyhow, this gossip stuff's really easy to fall into. And I think it's usually in our, in our most kind of close, casual kind of conversations, the people we're most comfortable with, where we're likely to get in trouble. Again, that guy's definition of gossip, it's bearing bad news behind someone's back out of a bad heart. That's, that's helpful for me to try to remember. Well, then the last uh, thing to talk about today a problem that destroys churches is, is spreading slander 
and other criticism. Spreading slander and other criticism. An older term for this would be fault finding. Uh, It just means finding faults with people. It's highlighting what's wrong with brothers and sisters. Here's, Here's what they got wrong. It's speaking negatively against someone. It's pointing out their problems. Saying bad stuff about people in your church. And, and, and sometimes that criticism is true. I mean, they really do have all those problems. But it can still be wrong for you to be talking about it to somebody else. But what's even worse, of course, is when the criticism is not true. You know, when, when, when actually the, the whole thing is a lie. The thing is a false accusation. And the word for that is slander. When you're, when you're spreading lies that are you're actually going to hurt somebody, hurt their reputation. The Bible has much to say about criticizing and slandering brothers and sisters. I, I, I think first of those verses in James, so that's where I'm going. Uh, James chapter 4, if you'd like to turn there. Chapter 4, verse 11. It says, Do not speak against one another, brethren. I mean, what a clear, strong, broad exhortation. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. If you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. I mean, it's, it's like we can put ourselves above God's law. Some, you know, we, we're judge and jury on this deal. We've decided this guy's bad. And then also, just across the page, James 5, verse 9, it says, Do not complain, brethren, against one another, that you yourselves may not be judged. So speaking against one another, complaining against one another. Back when I was a a, a college student, I had had a wonderful Christian roommate. And we, and we we became really close. Uh, over over the school year and and so we we're we we're just talking all the time like you know immature single Christian guys do and uh, and we got into a bad habit of making fun of people in our church criticizing them mocking them it's like how isn't that guy a dummy he never gets the jokes whatever and just that kind of thing and and at some point I can't remember which of us it was came across these verses in James. It's like, uh (laughs) uh-oh. The Bible says don't speak against one another. Don't complain about one another. And and we got all convicted. And and, and we really did change uh, by by God's grace how how we talked about about others in the church. It's practical stuff. And if you're not noticing, if you're not thinking we can slide into just bad habits, especially the people you're most comfortable with, the people in your family maybe, Let me read you some more Scriptures. Psalm 101, verse 5, it says, Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. It's a pretty strong one, isn't it? God says, you're slandering your neighbor. I'm coming after you. Proverbs 10, verse 18, He who conceals hatred as lying lips, he who spreads slander is a fool. Now you're called a fool. Back in Romans 14, it says, let us not judge one another anymore. The judgmental, critical attitude. Philippians 2, verse 14 says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Sometimes there's just a grumbling that goes on. You know, you don't like this thing. Why are we doing this thing in our church? It's a dumb idea. Why did the pastor come up with that? And it's just kind of this undercurrent of grumbly. Titus 3, verse 2, uh, talking about you know, how, to, how to behave. It says we should, should malign no one. Be uncontentious, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Not maligning anyone. That's the idea of criticism. Slander. Could fit in there. Now as we talked last week, there are times when it's necessary to confront a sin issue in a brother or sister. That can be right, good, healthy. But false accusations, grumbling, complaining, derogatory remarks, insulting language, picky judgmentalism, harsh condemnation. That stuff's all bad. It's, it's like being like the Pharisees. 
you know, who, who excelled in the picky judgmentalism stuff and they missed all the big things. It's actually being like the devil himself. Right? The devil's name, devil, means slander, something like that. He's called the, the accuser of the brethren. Instead, our instinct should be to think the best. Think the best of our, of our fellow Christians. Think the best motives of them as long as you can. That verse in Romans 12 says, give preference to one another in honor. I mean, honor them. Lift them up that way. Say good about them. Instead, do the opposite and look for ways to positively affirm the good characteristics that you see in others that God's grace has produced there. Say, that brother, that sister is great at this. It's so encouraging. I just read a book. Just read a book. I'll, I'll wave another book at you. This is called Practicing Affirmation. It's a whole book about this thing of, of affirming each other in our, our relationships. I just read that this, this uh, year. You're welcome to borrow that too. I mean, a very good practice to think of how we can affirm others rather than criticize. See, Here's something else to remember. If somebody comes to you with some complaint, some criticism about somebody else, and you get the feeling this isn't good, this is not healthy, what is, what is the question you should ask them? What is the question you should ask the critic? The question is, have you talked to that person directly? <laughs> about this issue? Have you gone to them? Have you asked them about it? And, and some, people, some people actually take it a step further. And they say, listen, you brought this up to me now. I'm involved in this now. And either you are going to go talk to them in the next week about this, or I'm going to go talk to them in the following week and I'll tell them that you told me about it and we're going to get something straightened out here. Now, a church that's practicing that kind of thing you're going, to, you're, going to have the, you're going to have the criticism die down pretty fast. Except for things that really need to be confronted. Like we said last time, some things do need to be confronted and dealt with in a loving way. If we want lasting unity in our church, we just got to watch our words. Bridle our tongues. Be careful about this. We can start a big fire with just a little flame. A few words... We shouldn't speak. So, four things we talked about today. What was the first one? Does anybody remember? Making big issues out of small issues. Right, yeah. Yeah. What was the second thing? Okay, the independent spirit, not seeing ourselves as dependent on one another in the body. And the third thing is gossip. The fourth was. Is slander and, and, and other kinds of wrong criticism. Uh, I'd really rather preach the Gospel and talk about this kind of stuff. <laughs> it's not where my joy is at, but it's necessary, as we said last week, to face these things at times, to examine ourselves at times. And, and, and when we do that, I mean, you know, I, I, maybe you're sitting there kind of playing back conversations in your mind or thinking about relationships that have soured in the past and thinking, you know, did I mess up in that? And, and you know, it's so good. It's so good when you, when you see our own failings and things to come back to the Gospel of God's grace. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that, that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. He died on the cross to pay for, for sins, including the sins we sin against each other and the ways we fail within the church. That's covered by the blood of Jesus. Praise God. That can be forgiven. And, and that, that He gives us grace not just to forgive, but also to go and sin no more. To change in ways. If you say, well, that's been a bad pattern in my life. I need to change. He can give you grace to change in those ways too. To be more like the Lord Himself. Praise God for that Gospel of grace. Uh, and I, I, I would say this though, if you feel convicted that you have sinned against somebody in a particular way, it, 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 it might be right. It might be necessary. Like we talked about last week, to go to them and, and, and deal with that issue so that there's nothing between you. 
You know, we, we talked about it last week in Matthew 5. If you, if you know your brother has something against you, Jesus says don't even offer your sacrifice. Just go talk to him instead. Deal with it. Make it right. And then go on with a clear conscience. Alright, Lord willing then, uh, we'll finish up next Sunday uh, this, this little series talking about four more things uh, in which, which Christians sometimes fail and hinder the unity of their churches.